I want to remain and hold unto the times when my heart was a mitten, for then did I feel the comforting warmth from my dreamings, searching, and discovery. My name's Tommy Simpson, and I grew up in uh, Illinois, uh, Dundee on the Fox River. And uh, I was born August 12th, 1939, which was pre-war, and all this is according to my mother. My mother was disciplining me and scolded me. I, I have no awareness of this. She told me this story, that at that age, and she sat me down in the middle of the living room on a stool to think about what I had done. And she came back, you know, 15 or 20 minutes later and said, that, told me that I'd taken all the shoelaces out of my shoes and I was making something out of it. <laughs> the community of times then was that you'd have breakfast and get on your bicycle and come back for dinner. And you had the whole world out there to explore and adventure and discover and find out how you fit into it all and a whole variety of different experiences from fishing to playing catch-up baseball and all this kind of thing. As I grew older and had a chance to look back is that that adventurous life seemed to be the imprint of what I did for the rest of my life. Instead of just get a job and work for somebody is that I looked for the adventure of um, and discovery of finding things and doing things with your hand and your body and that made me happy so that uh, I found out that I was an artist whether I knew it or not. I mean I always think of Tommy as just the ultimate maker um, because he's got the joy of just sort of experimenting with materials and and making things it's not you know, whether it's painted on panels, whether it's making furniture and painting it, whether it's wooden furniture that he paints with wood species. He's just interested in exploration and making. The joy of actually almost sketching three-dimensionally with materials. Um, he doesn't do all these elaborate kinds of schematics and construction uh, blow-ups and test joints. He just has at it. As we all are, we have no choice in our parents. Or, and, or do we, you know, sort of rethink what life was about when you're five years old? You know, it's like whatever your parents did, that seems what life was about, you know. And, uh, and I never thought about it until, you know, I've reached this aged, you know, age that I am now, that um, looking back and realizing that, a lot of the experiences were very different than a lot of kids' experiences. And it, it was a very viable connection to Mother Nature. I mean, it, was, it wasn't like you go to school and they say, this is what Mother you know, Nature's like. It's like you're out there in it, you know. Your hands are wet, your feet are wet, and, you know, uh, that kind of thing. And so it was um, much more influential aspect of my life than I really had realized.
Contemplate a mountain red, trees upon a yellow head. Think of good and jolly times, stomach pie and eyes of pine. Think of skies wrapped in twine, wishing you a kiss of mine. Remember this, my Valentine. Well, first of all, we have to say that Tommy was born special, so he just came that way. And I think a lot of his career has been about returning to a kind of childhood way of looking at the world. You know, I'm reminded of the thing that Picasso may or may not have said that it took him years to learn to draw like a child again. And I feel like Tommy kind of never lost that magic. Um, it's like he sees the world through an innocent pair of eyes that most of us just don't have access to. So for me, um, there's this quality of, well, the kind of quality that you get by spending a time with a child, sort of charm, um, idiosyncrasy, um, but also honesty and straightforwardness and a kind of directness or simplicity that Tommy really embodies. I came home and I said, I was 17, and I told my mother, um, or I was 18, I'm going to go around the world. So she said, fine. So she put me in the car and drove me to Elgin, and I got on the bus and went to California, to L.A. for two weeks, and went up to San Francisco and took a freighter to Hawaii. And was going around the world, and I worked there for six months for a Japanese company in construction. Then I was gonna go to New Zealand and, and I felt guilty that I should go back to school. So I went back to school and went to Northern Illinois um, and studied business. And then you could take um, electives. And so I thought I, I was, couldn't, I hadn't had a chance to make anything, you know, or use your hands or any of that sort of thing. So. I signed up for a printmaking class, and the teacher there, Keith Baker, um, showed me and convinced me and told me I was an artist. You know, it was like, okay, now explain to me what is an artist, you know, because I'd never gone to a museum, you know, or anything, had anything, I'd always made things, but never had anything to do with art or any of that sort of thinking, and so, I realized that I was an artist whether I liked it or not, you know. Well, the heart is sort of enjoy enjoyable. It's all an aspect of our culture and, and uh, literature and everything else, you know, and uh, it's a, to be aware of what your heart is asking. And I sort of, Funnily enjoyed um, the hearts because if you say heart, people say, "Oh, that's you know, that's sentimental. You know, it's like kid stuff. You know, forget it." Until you give them one, and then they really enjoy it. You know, it's a very strange combination, and um, that's the source of, of, of goodness and kindness and, and caring and friendship. That's a symbol of it versus your brain. It's like. Are you an Einstein? You know, you talk about your, you know, there's other symbols of things. And that was always a symbol of, of that sort of thing, which is a real defense against angst. This is the little box I made that's a head. And you open up the head and it's filled with heartfelt thanks. You can see it's made out of felt and it's something that I give to people when I need to give them a heartfelt thanks. And it's sort of a, a pun mobile or whatever you call it. It's, it's pun for fun. Anyway, <laughs> so that's it.
he thinks of furniture as a parameter within which he's going to work. It's instead of having a blank slate, what he's doing is saying, there's this whole thing called furniture that gives me a few boundaries within which I can really explore. And if you look at sort of the ways in which he's done series of pie safes, tables, et cetera, chairs, you can start to see how, you know, if you lined up all the chairs that he's made over time, it's incredibly varied, but it's within the chair format, four legs, a back, arms oftentimes. So to me, function is pretty, it's just a boundary within which he's functioning. And then I think he's one of these people, you know, does he think of it as art? I think he just thinks of it as creation um, more than anything else. And he's, he sort of leaves it up to you as to how you want to categorize it. I mean, that's what I said, that idea that you're, he's linking his joy in creating and fooling around and then hopefully bringing joy to wherever these objects end up. The ice guy would sit outside and and one day I'd just say hello to him when I walked by. One day I stopped and said hello and he had a, a Labrador. The Labrador came walking up from and he had a newspaper in its mouth. I thought that's unusual. And so he trained the dog to, to go up four or five blocks to the drugstore and the people knew the dog, so they put the, his newspaper in his mouth and the dog would bring it back to him at, at the ice house. <coughs> Growing up with those kind of existing stories, it's hard not to put stories and narrative in that are enjoyable in one's work. I've spent time making things and using myself my imagination and my ideas and come f success or failure made no difference. It was the fun of doing it and the pleasure. And so I've worked making furniture and making paintings and uh, doing printmaking and ceramics and jewelry, restoring cars, designing houses and building them, uh, building gardens. Uh, I've made Christmas cards for people, the Christmas ornaments for people. Um, I've made toilet seats for people. I've made garden gates for people. Uh, I've written four or five books. Um, I've had done a whole variety of things for the pleasure and fun, and um, you learn things and you fail many times. And um, so there was much more idiosyncratic self-realization that to find out who you were and how you related to the world, and and that was. I found a gift to myself to be able to do that, give it to other people. I guess my definition of idiosyncratic is to actually um, believe in yourself and apply and allow yourself to be you by either using your body or your mind or a little of everything to, uh, and don't judge whether if you bake a pie is worse than making a painting. They both take imagination and self-discipline and skill. And to give yourself much more self-value than, than the world gives to you. And to, to go ahead and, and just do it. Um, you can tell a three-year-old to do that and they'll happily do it. <laughs> You know, you tell a 15-year-old and they're like apprehensive, you know, because they've been taught differently. And at least keep that alive in your being because that's what people respond to is actually being you versus, you know, the rhetoric of some institution. That exhibition was a, um, a kind of pocket utopia is the way I would describe it. So, you know, it's this sort of fenced garden with all of this wondrous um, organic life, which of course he's made by hand in it. And um, words, words, you know, poetry uh, and inspiration scattered throughout and images, symbolic forms. And it really taps into a very, very deep 
current in not just American life, but in human life. Really, all cultures have this idea of, um, you know, the enclosure with plants and life and growth and food and sustenance as being um, a place of perfection, uh, of hope, of idealism. And it's very, very interesting to me that he decided to commit one of his most ambitious projects to that metaphor, that idea of the garden, because it seems to me like he has always known that making can be a kind of utopia, even if only temporarily. My Aunt Florence painted flowers. Her whole house was full of flower paintings. That's what she did to, just to occupy her time. And and my other Aunt Mary um, was uh, sort of always odd to me because, well, she t had me playing the piano with one finger, you know, kind of thing, <clears throat> when you were like five years old, you know, or four. and. <clears throat> She would take me out into the woods and we'd pick wildflowers and take them back to my other aunt to paint. And then um, they'd sit me down with a paint, a canvas that was, you know, three by five to paint the flowers, which, you know, if that's what you want me to do, I'll do it for sure. But, but the main thing was because if I had paint the painting, my Aunt Florence made wonderful mincemeat pie, so I'd always get a pie and ice cream if I fit, painted the painting, which is probably my motive for doing it. My home sat so close to the Fox River that at bedtime, one could pull the waters over oneself, blanketing the dark night away, washing out the day's scold, to reveal a bright new way. A bed is very representative of home and the idea of not just domesticity, but also safety and this idea of nesting that he often talks about. And again, the idea of dreaming. So that's where we do our dreaming in bed. And so he often makes his beds very explicitly speak of the kind of unloosed fantasy that happened during the nighttime hours. A chair, similarly for him, is a kind of anthropomorphic uh, object. It relates to the body, so it's a portrait, maybe of himself, maybe of a potential user, but it's like a thing out there in the world that corresponds to you and somehow externalizes your um, inner life. The ladder is, you're here and it takes you somewhere else. And it's used symbolically in a lot of literature, you know, the Jacob's Ladder and the Ladder of Success, you know, all this kind of thing. If you have six rungs or something, each in between each one is like six paintings. You know, it's like six series of, it's like you did a series of paintings. So I used it in that sense and it was fun to, to you know, put all kinds of different um, uh, narratives or stories in, in the ladders. to leave encouragement for everyone to try to be as creative and, and, and take advantage of the creativity that's actually in them. I was lucky that I could spend 60 years in a world that I created. And if they see somebody else did it and, and be encouraged by that, and don't be discouraged or turned down and say, oh, it's not good enough, you can't write or you can't paint or you can't do gardening because that Everybody is creative in some form or another. To believe that aspect of their own being, if I could leave that as a, 
that people would really be encouraged would be great.